you are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Here to bring you another show. Uh, I'm having, I think, maybe still having, definitely had some technical difficulties there. Uh, but I think, I think we're coming through pretty clear now, so we should be fine. Uh, computer moving slow as hell for a second there. And then, of course, I overwhelmed it trying to speed up stuff and open programs and all this stuff. Uh, let me just shout out the chat room that's already active. Black Excellence is here saying we cannot celebrate too much. We cannot get complacent. White impotency is planning a comeback to this egg on their face. We must keep the pressure on white uh impotency uh, i think black excellence is referring to the derek chauvin uh trial and the verdict that came in that he was guilty on all counts uh kevin k42 says greetings uh to black excellence you're correct we must not waver in this small victory we must keep the pressure on white impotency we, we must keep taking our antibiotics till it is finished. Uh, Black Edson says FTP, ACAB. Uh, NYC Beauties is here. It's saying caution, discipline, and economic building must be the agenda always. And yes, FTP. You guys know what FTP means, right? Uh, Kevin Care 42 is here. It says Black First and Always. Uh, NYC Sports Archives is here saying agreed. Rico Cooper Photography is here. Yes. The whole biker gang of Brooklyn is outside. Uh, peace to Rico Cooper Photography. Uh, the Pro Black Perspective is here saying peace, peace, peace to you too, brother. Glad to have all you guys here. Um, you know, FTP, as always. Uh, glad to have you guys here. Um, what do you guys think about that Chauvin case? Do you think, do you think they had no choice because it was just too clear, too blatant, too evident, and they had no choice? Or do you believe, like some people believe, that white folks will give up a white guy every once in a while just to quell right just to quell the thoughts of the people uh to make people think that there is no you know so-called white supremacy and uh, uh you know and so they, they they throw one of the people under the bus god damn what's all the noise about so they throw uh someone under the bus you know, what What do you guys think happened there? But I saw, um, I saw the pro-black perspective say something on Twitter earlier that's so true, man. They, so the setup, right, in a lot of black folks' mind, the setup was that there was two black immigrants on the jury board. And so, you know, the blame was gonna go, if this, if, if this didn't come back as guilty, the blame was gonna go on these two black immigrants on the board. Meanwhile, you, you, you're not focusing on like the six or eight 
uh uh you know the six or so uh white uh folks on 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 jury but you you you're dead set ready to go right uh against these two black immigrants how did not come back guilty and like uh like the pro black perspective said earlier and I'll say it too you're welcome on behalf of black immigrants right you're welcome anyway just to remind you guys this podcast is part of a podcast network uh called kwaz radio uh there are other shows in the network you should be checking out like i just mentioned the pro-black perspective is one of them but there are others that you should be checking out as well this is DA you tuned to the harsh reality podcast providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community only on kwaz radio peace family this is oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions you are listening to the bitter medicine podcast on kwaz radio make sure to also check out the queen's council also on kwaz radio right um Uh, the, the pro black perspective says, I think mine's gonna call on camera and the whole world was watching. Yeah, but I, there's also been other c- cases where we've caught folks on camera and, uh, you know, you didn't get the outcome that you wanted to get or, or, or that you ought to get when something like this happened, right? So, uh, you know, I'm just curious, but that, that's, that's the pro black perspective thought. I'm just curious to see what all the rest of you in the chat room are thinking in terms of this guilty verdict that came down on this white boy. Um, So tonight's paper, as you can see, is about philosophy's role in Afrocentric education. It's by Charles Viharan from Howard University. Uh, now the, the, this paper might be, you know, this paper might be a little bit troubling, uh, because this person might be writing about, you know, Greek philosophy, uh, et cetera, as opposed to an African, uh, philosophy. So let's see what they're talking about. So should philosophy be introduced as a formal subject to kindergarten through 12th grade students in Afrocentric schools? You know what? I like how it starts off with that question. I'm going to uh, place that question right in the chat room. Uh, I'm gonna pin it. You guys can, uh, you guys can answer that question. Anyone who comes in the room uh, can come and answer that question, KW Don 7 makes a great point. We got we have to wait for the sentencing. Excellent point. Uh, the pro black perspective says you gotta make your custom Queens Council ad. Yeah, I you know it's it might turn to it might it, it, it might come out to be the the fact that I have to get I mean, either myself or I have to get someone else around me to create this ad this bump for the Queen's Council because, uh, you know, it it just sticks out like a thaw, uh, a, uh, sorry, a sore thumb, right? That I'm mentioning it, right? As opposed to it being read. So that's the question I, I, I'd like you guys to answer. Should philosophy be introduced as a formal subject to kindergarten through 12th grade students in Afrocentric schools. Let's tackle that first question. U.S. public education's aversion to philosophy is so pervasive that Afrocentric educators should consider whether they have assimilated this bias. This essay considers ancient Greek philosophy's possible roles in its construction. While challenging Plato and Aristotle's arguments against philosophizing before age 30, the essay explains philosophy's absence in public schools through structural similarities between ancient Greece and the contemporary United States. The essay's objectives are to stimulate Afrocentric educators 
to formulate an explicit Afrocentric philosophy, to compare ancient African philosophies in Egypt and Nubia to contemporary African philosophies, and to reflect on the philosophies of Africana history they are imparting to their students. The essay's conclusion examines Africa's creativity in the context of new explanations of African development. Should philosophy be introduced as a formal subject to kindergarten through 12th grade students in Afrocentric schools? Public education, why, why, is, this, why is this reading the same again? Uh, public education's aversion to philosophy is so pervasive that Afrocentric educators should consider whether they have assimilated this bias. However, this task assumes that Afrocentrists share a working definition of the term philosophy and can reach some consensus on how to introduce philosophy to students in Afrocentric schools. Afrocentrists have not yet agreed on an explicit autonomous philosophy that answers philosophy's four basic questions. What exists? How can we know it? What is valuable? And how should we live our lives? An Afrocentric philosophy guides the writings of thinkers such as Molefi Asante, for example, but he was not explicitly cataloged. Uh, he has not explicitly cataloged his answers to these four questions. Although Asante claimed that, claimed with Sheikh Anta Job, uh, that ancient Egyptian philosophy is a primary inspiration for valid Afrocentric thought. Neither thinker postulated the hypothesis that none is the ground of is the ground of existence of the of that the universe endlessly cycles between the chaos of none and the order of Maat, wheeling through eternity like the serpent Apophis. Neither thinker dwelled extensively on the remarkable parallels between ancient Egyptian and contemporary cosmological accounts of the beginning and end. Of the universe. Asante's epistemology is vital to his attempts to mediate cultural conflict. If he does not explicitly define the roles that mystical in intuition, faith, reason, and sensory experience should play in an Afrocentric theory of knowledge. This article's second objective then is to stimulate Afrocentric educators to formulate an explicit Afrocentric philosophy that answers philosophy's four basic questions. The article's presupposition is that philosophy, like all other primary academic subjects, is practiced by all cultures. In Eurocentric histories, philosophy appears as a creation of the Greeks, who after all coined the expression, quote, the love of wisdom. But if wisdom is defined as knowledge that is synoptic, foundational, and self-correcting, then we should look for philosophies in early civilizations whose thoughts were, whose thoughts we are able to translate. The article's third task then is to stimulate Afrocentric educators to compare and contrast ancient African philosophies in Egypt and Nubia with other African philosophies that are currently available to scholarship only through cultural practice in contemporary African traditions that claim long histories. Philosophical scholarship on these traditions is comparatively recent and has been conducted largely by scholars whose academic training is European-based. The article's final task is to stimulate Afrocentric educators to reflect on the philosophies of African history that they are uh, imparting to their students. Educators whose discourse on Africa is shaped by Job should know that he is following a tradition of explanation shaped by Hegel and Aristotle. Diop cannot condone Hegel's bias against Africa or an Aristotelian philosophy that weaves slavery and education together in inextricable ways. But these philosophers' ideas about environmental determinism uh, environmental determinism have influenced Job's thought. Nevertheless, with Fanon, 
he uh, uh, has argued that humans are morally obliged to overcome environmental constraints in pursuit of survival creativity. The article's conclusion will examine Africa's unique creativity in the context of new explanations of African development. Although these new explanations follow classical models espoused by Diop and Aristotle, their attention to the details of African life remind us of Job's own model for Afrocentric scholarship, return to Africa herself. So let's see if anyone answered that question. No answer to that question. You know, follow up to, to that question. The question being, should philosophy be introduced as a formal subject to kindergarten through 12th grade students in Afrocentric schools? You know, the follow up to that is, according to this paper, in the Eurocentric model of education, which I was not aware of, um, I guess particularly here in America, you don't get philosophy uh, in school. Why do you think it is that Europeans don't teach philosophy in school, you know, from a young age to continue? Uh, so we come to the section called why philosophy plays no role in U.S. pre-college education. To evaluate the roles philosophy should play in Afrocentric education, I will first define philosophy. Risking the criticism that my methodology is Eurocentric, I will begin with an examination of Plato and Aristotle's definitions of philosophy for two reasons. First, Plato and Aristotle's philosophies of education continue to dominate U.S. public education. Afrocentric educators should be able to identify that influence. Second, Afrocentric scholars can use Plato and Aristotle's formulations to show how their methods diverge from Eurocentric models. Marimba Ani, in 1994, <clears throat> has relied on this technique extensively. By the way, you guys should really follow what the uh, pro-black perspective has been doing lately. They've been going through uh, each chapter so far, and I think the next episode they're going to go through three chapters in one, in one sitting. They've been going through Marimba Ani's book, uh, Urugu. So you guys should check that out if you're fans of that, of that book. Plato and Aristotle claim that philosophy is, in, is indispensable to the good life. Yet both advocate waiting until the age of 30 before introducing philosophy, and then only introducing it to perhaps one out of a hundred students. Forget about W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, 1973 talent, you know, quote-unquote talented 10th, right? Plato and Aristotle's sense of elitism, grounded in an Athenian culture supported by slavery, forced them to restrict philosophy to the talented 100th. It is ironic that philosophy is not taught in a U.S. culture aspiring to freedom. Aristotle said that everywhere men are in chains and only philosophy can make them free. Mm. Aristotle at least had the excuse that introducing philosophy to the general public in ancient Athens would mean the collapse of its slave-based economy. What excuse do school boards across the country have for keeping philosophy away from all students except those who are rich or lucky enough to go to college? And if Afrocentric educators aim at their students' liberation, how can they introduce philosophy to students in their earliest years? Plato and Aristotle had telling arguments against teaching philosophy to the young. Many educators will be sympathetic to those arguments. They will agree with Plato and Aristotle and members of school boards throughout contemporary America that philosophy is simply too dangerous for the unprepared, that is to say, the young mind. rubbish. This brings us to Plato's arguments against philosophizing before age 30. In Plato's, uh, the dialogue, the, the collected dialogues of Plato in 1966 view, uh, philosophies for bidding nature should keep it out of the hands of the young. Plato's definition of the, dial, of the dialectician who embodies the spirit of philosophy knows why philosophy is too hard for the young. 
the dialectician is quote is able to exact an amount of the essence of each thing end of quote and one who is unable to do this insofar as he is incapable of rendering an account to himself and others does not possess full reason and intelligence about the matter whoever is able to know and explain the essence of everything must possess wisdom in the sense of total knowledge rare is the person who can make such a claim this definition sets philosophy above all other studies to be as it were the coping stone and no other higher kind of study could rightly be placed above it. Plato's Republic details a course of education that starts with, starts with physical arts, such as dance and gymnastics, and then moves to more abstract studies, such as music, mathematics, and sciences, such as astronomy. These high-minded studies have more barbaric companions, such as conducting children to war on horseback, to the spectators, and wherever... It may be safe, bring them to the front and give them a taste of blood as we do with whelps. Only those children who excel in both the abstractions of the mind and the, and the arts of war are finally to be allowed to begin not philosophy proper, but the study that is the gateway to philosophy. If there's one thing these folks are good at, they're good at warring, right? At the age of 20, the very best of the survivors, the talented 10th, will be given great awards and then required to gather the studies which they disconnectedly pursued as children in their former education into a comprehensive survey of their affinities with one another and with the nature of things. An analog for this phase of platonic education is the afrocentric method called afrocology you know asante 1990 imagine afrocentric educators waiting to introduce afrocology to their students until age 20. connecting diverse studies into a unified whole is the chief test of the dialectic nature and its opposite for he who can view things in their connection is a uh, dialectician he who cannot is not. After pursuing connectivity for 10 years until the age of 30, students who pass yet another pruning process that winnows out the talented 100th are subject to a new method, quote, to prove and test them by the power of dialectic to see which of them is able to disregard the eyes and other senses and go on to being itself in company with truth. End of quote. At the ripe age of 30, students finally begin to practice the true method of philosophy, dialectic. Far from being a mere process of disputation, uh, dialectic equips a practitioner to give an account, as we saw above, of the essence of all things. Its primary tactic is to ask a student to give an account of the essence of important abstractions, such as justice or truth or happiness. The main objective of the teacher of dialectic is to show the student how her, unlike Aristotle, Plato advocated education in dialectic for women, account of an important essence must be wrong from her own point of view, right? Which was, it's just weird, right? Um, Plato's Republic is itself the embodiment of the dialectic method. However, dialectic poses a grave danger even to such elderly, quote unquote, elderly students uh, as 30 year olds. Its practitioners are infected with lawlessness. Its practitioners are infected with lawlessness. All right. Maximum precautions are in order. For I fancy you have not failed to observe the lads when they first get a taste of disputation, misuse it as a form of sport, always employing it contentiously and imitating confuters. They themselves confute others. They delight like puppies in pulling about and tearing it with words all who approach them. And when they have themselves confuted many and been uh, confuted by many, 
they quickly fall into a violent distrust of all that they formerly held true. And the outcome is that they themselves and the whole business of philosophy are discredited with other men. Students practice dialectic for five years and then return to public life for 15 years to become military and civilian leaders. Finally, at the age of 50, the survivors, true Renaissance men, the talented 100th, are expected to assume the mantle of philosopher kings. When they have thus beheld the good itself, they shall use it as a pattern for the right ordering of the state and the citizens and themselves throughout the remainder of their lives, each in his turn devoting the greater part of their time to the study of philosophy. But when the turn comes for each, toiling in the service of the state and holding office for the city's sake, regarding the task not as odious, but a necessity. And so when each generation has educated others like themselves to take their place as guardians of the state, they shall depart to the islands of the blessed and there dwell. And the state shall establish public memorials and sacrifices for them as to divinities if the uh, Pythian oracle approves or if not, as to divine and godlike men. That's from the Republic. Unlike his student Aristotle, Plato magnanimously uh, uh, avers that women as well as men may become philosopher kings. However, like Paul Pot in the killing fields of Cambodia and Chairman Mao in the Cultural Revolution in China, Plato suggests that his vision of the perfect philosopher's state can best be realized by separating children from their parents and all other adults, except of course, the philosophers. <clears throat> all inhabitants above the age of 10, the philosopher kings, will send out into the fields and they will take over the children, remove them from the manners and habits of their parents and bring them up in their own customs and laws, which will be such as we have described. This is the speediest, easiest way in which such a city and constitution as we have portrayed could be established and, prop and prosper and bring most benefit to the people among whom it arises. Socratic irony or proto-European barbarism. Right? Uh, we have no consensus from Platonic scholars on this point. But if it is the latter, perhaps we need a lot more philosophy in the curriculum. So what do you guys say? What do you guys say? Socratic irony or proto-European uh, barbarism? The hallmark of Plato's philosophy of education is its, exclusive, is, is its exclusivity. Rigorous education must prepare the best students for the most difficult tasks ruling those with a lower nature than themselves. Plato advocated, uh, uh, Plato advocated aristoc aristocracy, uh, quote, rule by the best, right? Quote, unquote, rule by the best over democracy, right? Aristocracy, rule by the best over democracy, rule by the country's bumpkins, right? And I'm, that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting, right? But it's you know, there's there's something there's something to to chew on there, right? Do you want your your people to be ruled by the best over democracy, or ruled by the country bumpkins, right? And ruled by any old buddy. The form of this of his argument was simple: if you need surgery. You would only go to the best surgeon. If you need ruling, something far more complex than surgery, you would, you would only want the best ruler. The best ruler is the wisest, and the wise know all things, including the most difficult subject, how to rule. How do you guys feel about that analogy? All right? How do you feel about that analogy? So in the chat room, there's some activity. Uh, let's go back up. 
the pro black perspective says philosophy is for underclass people so yeah we should learn in our schools but whites don't teach it to their lower class uh kw don seven says who would you consider an african philosopher i would consider amos wilson the greatest african philosopher of the 20th century uh the pro-black perspective says garvey was a sort of philosopher in the area too i agree with that uh Nkrumah too yeah Nkrumah too was a philosopher you got to give him his credit uh al mansour is considered one of the best of the 90s but i'm unfamiliar with his work uh elaine Locke also but he's western focus Kwame Toure was another student of philosophy too. Uh, the pro-black perspective goes on to say, I don't mind Plato's dismissal of democracy. It is a dumb idea. Most people don't know shit. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That's something that you want, right? It's something that you want. It's like, it's like what I've said on this show in the past, what the pro-black perspective has said on his show as well. You know, you in fact, you, in fact, you do want your talented 10th or whatever you know whatever number you're using right that's who you want to 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 really lead right this idea of everyone has a voice uh that sounds cool and i'm not saying that people should be voiceless but this idea that everyone ha has a chance to to lead right that uh, we we have to we have to kind of reel that in I suspect this is why we have so much problems in black community as it is. We have too much voices, right? We have entertainers who have voices <clears throat> and the entertainers are not fully immersed and knowledgeable in the subject that they're talking about. They have an opinion, but our, our masses shouldn't be following, right? Entertainers and their opinions, right? To continue. I, I, I hope you guys are, uh, are liking the paper so far. All right, let's continue. Aristotle in philosophy and education. Like his teacher Plato, Aristotle believed that philosophy aimed at knowledge of essences. But Aristotle's essences were not pure forms, existing in some sort of mythical hyperspace. Rather, they were uh, universals abstracted from everyday experience. A universal is simply that which all examples of, of, of a particular kind of thing have in common. We discover universals through a process of abstraction. In abstracting, we literally pull apart, pull apart an idea from its concrete instance. Philosophy for our soul is thought applied to itself. We reach ever higher orders of universals by abstracting from our abstractions. In practicing philosophy, we imitate the gods who are thoughts thinking themselves. Unlike Plato, Aristotle does not deny that young children can perform complex abstractions, but they cannot be philosophers because philosophers must perform their abstractions over the whole of evidence and children have had but the merest taste of experience. Sorry, over the whole of experience and children have had but the merest taste of experience. Children can reach, uh, can reach universals easily enough, but only if they've had concrete experiences from which they can generalize. Aristotle asks himself why a boy may become a mathematician, but not a philosopher or a physicist. Is it because the objects of mathematics exist by, by abstraction? While the first principles of these other subjects come from experience, and because young men have no conviction about the latter, but merely use the proper language, while the essence of mathematical objects is plain enough for them. Like Plato, Aristotle believed that philosophy aims at total knowledge. Quote, the wise man knows all things as far as possible, although he has not knowledge of each of them in detail, end of quote. The philosopher must start with knowledge of at least some details, but details become secondary once one has abstracted from the details to the essences. Knowing all things must belong to him who has in the highest degree universal knowledge. 
but he knows in a sense all the instances that fall under the universal. And these things, the most universal, are on the whole the hardest for men to know, for they are farthest from the senses. Right? That's from metaphysics. Like contemporary scientists who predict results from the application of laws or theories, philosophers know what form every detail must take. The details are not, are not unimportant, but it is a trivial matter to deduce them uh, from a generalization. The hardest task, however, is to discover the generalization in the first place. Quote, he who can learn things that are difficult and not easy for man to know is wise, right? Aristotle insists that philosophers who abstract <clears throat> to the highest universals are capable of knowing the causes of all things. A good test of, of a philosopher is whether he can teach the causes of all things to others, right? Um, however, the ultimate test of a philosopher is whether he can command, quote, the wise man must be ordered, must not be ordered, but must order, and he must not obey another, but the less wise must obey him. Mm. So this brings us to the summary of arguments against pre-college philosophy. Although Plato and Aristotle disagree in fundamental ways about basic questions of being and knowledge, they concur that teaching philosophy should be delayed until the age of 30. Their combined arguments may be summarized as follows. Philosophy must be based on experience. Children simply have not had enough experience to philosophize. Philosophy must be based on, abs on abstraction. Although children Although child prodigies in mathematics show that children have remarkable powers of, of, of abstraction, philosophical abstraction must cover the whole of experience. Children do not command that range of experience. Philosophy, number three, philosophy's methods include not only abstraction, but also refutation. Children exposed to philosophy's massive powers of criticism become in Plato's expression Mythologist, haters of argument. They come to believe that truth is a matter of construction based inevitably on the will to power. Chaos must then rule their lives. Introduced too early, philosophy can only be hurtful. Both Plato and Aristotle believe that knowledge is power. As a search for wisdom or total knowledge, philosophy promises absolute power. Children do not have the discretion to handle such power. So that right there tells you why they don't teach it to white kids, right? Especially when you look at the beginnings of this thing where, you know, they were, they had, they had their own slave uh, economies and stuff going on. They wouldn't want the quote unquote lowly slave right to to have this kind of understanding this kind of knowledge right uh what would that do to others you know uh so that 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 explains it and uh, and of course that explains why they're not going to teach our children in the public school system philosophy right the more I reflect on the philosophies that have guided U.S. education, the more I come to believe that Plato and Aristotle are still a primary inspiration for its contemporary practice. And what follows, I want, I want to advance the hypothesis that a key component of that inspiration is pernicious. In advocating philosophy's exile from pre-college curricula, Plato and Aristotle have helped to, quote-unquote, dumb down public education. Making them a primary cause of the follies of contemporary education would give their thought too much power over a 2,000 year interval. However, their rhetoric derives its real force from structural similarities between Athenian society and our own. Mm. 
Recent studies on slavery in ancient Athens have argued that slavery was a fundamental organizing principle rather than an isolated aspect of the society. The essence of such a society must be the assumption that some are born to rule and some born to be ruled. If, as Aristotle said above, quote, the wise man must not be ordered, but must order, and he must not obey another, but uh, the less wise must obey him, end of quote, philosophers must rule, and all others must obey them. In ancient Athens, enslaved persons were not normally given access to formal education, so they had no chance to prove their philosophical prowess. Only the landed elite had the school or the show, uh, the leisure for formal education. And of that elite, only a, f only a select few were presumed to have the capacity to philosophize, giving away philosophy's power indiscriminately, even to the children of the privileged elite, would upset the natural order envisioned by Plato and Aristotle that this order conveniently followed the class lines of the societies they were born into was not a matter on which Plato or Aristotle remarked. They know what they were doing. They know what they were doing. These guys were setting up the groundworks, right? For this European behavior, right? I grant that Plato and Aristotle were divided on the question of whether enslaved persons and women could become philosophers, but they were unanimous in insisting that only the elite of the elite could, pro could profit from philosophy. Teaching philosophy to the less than noble could only bring a society to ruin. The United States is no longer a slave society. Comparing the United States to Athens may seem far-fetched. However, in their role as the foundations of societies, philosophies take a long time to change. I think it can be reasonably argued that the descendants of enslaved persons in the United States still experience the effects of slavery, particularly in the public schools. But I want to argue more generally that the public schools reinforce a slave mentality by refusing to include philosophy in their curricula. I do not mean to uh, impugn uh, the good intentions of the heroic souls entrusted with public education who carry out their task with scant uh, remuneration and less respect. Philosophy is exiled from public schools in the United States for the same kinds of reasons that it, as it was in Athens. We style ourselves a democracy, but very few of our deems are given access to the power of the media. We call ourselves egalitarian, but we use standardized tests to assess merit. SAT scores follow income curves with remarkable symmetry. Just as in Athens, power in the United States is hierarchical. And for the most part, the, hi the hierarchy is sorted out through systems of education. The higher the education, the more philosophy to be found. The better the education, the more philosophy to be found. At Harvard University, most of my students coming from private schools have had some exposure to philosophy, unlike my students coming from public schools. And that's what blew me away. You know, I, I of course, never attended public schools in America, but like in my hometown, there's some philosophy. It, it might not be, you know, directly African philosophy, Although uh, Caribbean, quote unquote, Caribbean philosophy does come from African philosophy, right? So we had that, you know? So it, it's weird for me to think of, you know, public school uh, education not giving their folks uh, philosophy. But when you read the paper, you start to, you start to realize why that is. To continue, I do not want to make moral judgments about the merits of hierarchies in this essay. Perhaps Athens could not have achieved its glories without being a slave-based economy. Perhaps even post-industrial economies cannot flourish without rigid class distinctions. 
but I do want to argue that the only reason we can have for excluding philosophy from U.S. schools must be Athens's reason. Teaching philosophy means redistributing power. How do you guys feel about that statement? In 2021, we have, we're talking about building a, a new African-centered curriculum, right? My question is, uh, do we think that a part of including African philosophy would be uh, to give back power? Is, is, that a, is that your basic understanding? Is that, is that your basic belief? That we would want to give um, our children, our learners, African philosophy, because that would mean a redistribution, if you will, of power to them, right? Like most cultures in the history of the world, Athens had a strong fear that there was not enough power to go around. So power had to be concentrated at the top. But the United States in its founding documents had a vision of a society so powerful that power could be distributed all the way to the bottom. Oh, come on. Public education has been the instrument of the redistribution of that power. But public education has withheld the true instrument of that redistribution, philosophy. By philosophy, I don't mean a subject that has become an academic discipline taught by professional philosophers. I do not mean a subject defined by a canon of texts. In the millennia since Plato and Aristotle, the terms philosophy and science have switched roles on a number of occasions. Newton described his work in mechanics as natural philosophy. And Philadelphia still houses a, a philosophical society that is dedicated to what we now call physics. In fact, if we take Plato at his word, the contemporary academic subject that attempts to give an exact account of the essences of all things is science. The contemporary equivalent of Plato's essence or, 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 or essences are the mathematical formulations of the four known forces, gravitational, electromagnetic, and nuclear, weak and strong. Philosophers' claim to provide essential accounts are so hotly contested that contemporary philosophers appear on the scene as Plato's puppies, tearing or perhaps deconstructing everything to pieces. The following points synthesize a definition of philosophy that illustrates how some of philosophy's best work has been performed by thinkers conventionally styled as scientists. Uh, in, that, in that list that you guys were providing also too, we could also uh, put Bobby Wright in there too. Uh, you could even put Asa uh, G. Hilliard in there as well, right? As, uh, uh, but, and, you know, some of them are of course more US centered, but you could put them in that list as well. Uh, so number one, philosophy aims at maximum abstraction, producing concepts of or hypotheses capable of mapping vast ranges of experience. For example, gravity, matter, evolution, universe, spirit, being, God, none, uh, Kepera, Ra, Ma'at. Philosophy reveals its universal aspirations by trying to cover the maximum range of experience with a minimum number of symbols. Philosophy aims to get to the foundation of all experience. If a philosophical or scientific system claims to have reached a foundation, philosophers will uh, excavate that foundation to undermine it. The point of philosophy, however, is not to undermine belief, but to furnish it with a more secure foundation. The foundations of the most powerful systems of thought contain their old foundations as special cases. Einstein, for example, substituted uh, Riemannian geometry. All right, so it seems like I was disconnected for a minute there. Uh, refresh if you have to. It seems like I was disconnected. It, if it doesn't seem so on your end, then, then ignore. It's fine.
I see Life with Nelly is with us. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Life with Nelly. You know, don't be rude. Say it back. Kevin Care for you too said we need our own. We have to start thinking like our ancestors and not like our oppressors. Right? To continue. Uh number three, beyond all other disciplines, philosophy is free or creative because it criticizes disciplinary assumptions or foundations to create new knowledge. Why those who receive a PhD in any subject are called doctors of philosophy. Like Africology, number four, like Africology, philosophy always searches out maximum scope or connectivity, looking beyond the confines of, of particular uh, disciplines to create a synoptic vision of all people, of all, uh, sorry, of all possible experience. Number five, philosophy seeks the meanings that ground all other disciplines in two ways by furnishing the motivation for pursuing them and by making sure that the symbols used to convey results in those more particular subjects are meaningful in a semantic sense. Number six, the most abstract and ethereal of all disciplines, philosophy, is at the same time the most practical. It furnishes the fundamental goals of our lives and urges us to revise them when they break down. Number seven, philosophy moves us to show ourselves wrong on our own grounds by seeking out deeply hidden self-contradiction or by exposing discrepancies between our theories and experience when we are, mo when we are most blind to them. This brings us to a section of the paper called Why Plato and Aristotle Are Wrong About Introducing Philosophy at an Early Age. This should be pretty good here. Uh, let's see what the author comes up with. Although I agree in part with Plato and Aristotle about fundamental methods of philosophy, I disagree with their philosophy of, of philosophical education. I hypothesize that their reasons for delaying philosophy until the age of 30 emerge from the structural qualities of Athenian society rather than philosophy's intrinsic nature. With Plato and Aristotle, I agree that philosophy is one of the most demanding subjects precisely by reason of its abstract nature. In this regard, it is like mathematics. Both subjects require intense forms of concentration and both require eager contemplation of what often appears to be counterintuitive. Galileo struggled to force his reason to overcome his uh, common sense notion about the Earth. The Earth's motion uh, matches Riemann and Labochevsky's embarrassment over their non-Euclidean geometries. Conventional history of science presents Thales and Pythagoras's speculations that all things come from water or numbers as astounding new turns for human thought. However, the first ancient Egyptians to conjecture that the universe evolves out of a watery chaos into a structured sun had to overcome the common sense view of fire and water as polar opposites. Some two millennia before the pre-Socratic uh, empiricists. That's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. If philosophy is so difficult, shouldn't we start in on it right away? Plato in particular thought that mathematics should be taught as soon as possible because it is a stepping stone to philosophy. But the abstract concentration required in mathematics is quite different than that of philosophy. Mathematics is engaged in purely formal reflection on abstract relationships conveyed by the relations of symbols to other symbols. Philosophy steps outside of symbolic sets to engage its own abstractions with lived experience. William James's quote unquote blooming buzzing confusion, uh, like science, Philosophy is an abstraction on life itself. Philosophy is not an isolated subject, but a fundamental part of thinking. Thinking is connecting, but thinking's uh, connections take place on many levels, ranging from the simple to the complex, the abstract to the concrete, the universal to the unique, the general to the particular. 
Each of the levels, however, not only implicates the others, but also is dependent on them for its own construction. As Aristotle said, we cannot have an abstraction until we have had a concrete experience. But an experience gets its connections to other experiences only through acts of abstraction. Philosophy is that part of thinking uh, that aims at maximum abstraction, universal, universality, and complicity. Because massive abstractions are the most tenuous of human thoughts, philosophy is riddled with ambiguity. But philosophy's abstractions drive our lives. Justice, truth, goodness, ma'at, happiness, beauty, madness, glory, love, God, and heaven, right? Like Plato's puppy, philosophy tears at these concepts, but never tears them to pieces. Philosophy seeks the eternal in that it never finishes with its material. An essentializing process, it now essentializes against essentializing. Like Shelley's clouds, philosophy always, quote, arises and unbuilds itself again, end of quote. A project that can never be complete at best begin at an early age. And, and I have to agree with that. I have to agree with the idea that if something is ever evolving, so, and in this case, we're talking about thoughts, right? If thoughts are ever evolving, it makes sense to start thinking even sooner. Start developing thoughts even sooner. So that you can, you can master, right? <clears throat> the evolution of these thoughts to stay on top of things, right? I can agree with Plato and Aristotle that philosophy is the most difficult of human enterprises. If philosophy is simply that part of thought that reaches out to all other thoughts to try to connect them, to stimulate new thoughts, to force us to revise our thoughts, and finally to tell us when to put an end to thinking. Perhaps the hardest part of philosophy is knowing when to use it and when to lose it. If philosophy is the most abstract, foundational, and stimulating part of every thinking act, and all subjects should be taught in a philosophical way. And if philosophy is the most difficult part of thinking, then it should begin when thinking itself starts. Absolutely. Waiting until college, even high school or, 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 or elementary school is too late. The more difficult the task, the more time it should take. The madness of our age, its threats of biological, chemical, and nuclear holocaust, suggest that we are not putting enough time on task in this most difficult of tasks. To summarize, philosophy is not a special subject or a sacred canon of texts. It is the ungrounded, universal foundation of our thinking that constantly subjects itself to revision through discoveries and all other kinds of thinking. It is highly doubtful that children do not naturally uh, subject their thoughts to revision, and it is manifest that such an inclination can be diminished by anti-philosophical education. To conclude this section <clears throat> with our story, I agree that children cannot philosophize over experience that they have not had, but they can philosophize over their own experience. Children cannot generalize over all experience as philosophers such as Kant and Hegel have attempted to do. But they can be encouraged to generalize over the limited experience they have had. Children should not set out to undermine all their foundational beliefs, but they can be encouraged to examine beliefs that are causing great distress. Teaching children philosophy might be the best form of defense against their abuse by authority figures. With Plato, I agree that philosophy is dangerous, but philosophy is a danger that life has given us to set against life's other dangers, ours and our children's. In a way, philosophy is the master art of self-defense. Children have, a mu uh, have as much right to this martial art as their parents, perhaps even more given their relatively defenseless 
nature. I I I like what he's putting down here. Right. I like what he's putting down here. Um to continue. Plato and Aristotle will deny philosophy to children because of their immaturity. Two millennia after their time, however, we can reflect on the immaturity of our species. Plato said that the wise know all things. We are barely beginning to grasp a sense of the scale of the universe. And we're just now beginning to imagine that there may be uh, universes outside of our universe. We as a species cannot begin to claim to be on the path to knowing all things. And yet that plain fact has never stopped us from philosophizing. The species cannot give an account of the essence of all things. And the species cannot show all things in their connections. And yet the species still philosophizes. Why should it stop its children from philosophizing? This guy is making excellent points. And also, that statement, right? The wise know all things. Is to me is one of the most bullshit statements you can put out there. But to me, that's kind of what Europeans do. You know, they come with these grandiose statements and we end up following the bullshit too, right? We end up repeating, you know, parroting these same, these same kind of talking points. Plato said that philosophy would be too dangerous for children. Is philosophizing being too dangerous? Has philosophizing, has philosophizing being too, being too dangerous for the species? Philosophy shapes both science and technology and their uses. Nuclear technology has brought us to the brink of nuclear winter several times in the last part of this century. Biotechnology seeks to marry smallpox and Ebola viruses to advance biological warfare. Philosophy coupled with science and technology has put the survival of the species at risk. The species itself is hardly mature enough to handle the power that philosophy conveys. Shouldn't children be given an earlier start on this most difficult of tasks so that they have a better chance of diminishing the threats to life that we have bequeathed them? This brings us to a section called Philosophy in Afrocentric Education. I want to pause here for a station ID break. I'll be back on the other side. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Also check out the Queen's Council podcast here on KWAZ Radio. By the way, if you're here with me right now, live especially, or if you listen to the playback, uh, make sure you go over and like and subscribe. Uh, click the bell for KWAZ Radio. Right now, those numbers on that channel is way too low. Uh, I know myself, the Pro Black Perspective, Harsh Reality Podcast, and uh, the Queen's Council have enough listeners that if, if everyone were to go over to KWAZ Radio and, and click the subscribe button, we'll have pretty good numbers over there on that channel. More things to come on that channel. Chat room is kind of quiet, it seems, but that's all good. Uh, we'll continue through the paper. We reach a section called the philosophy in Afrocentric education. If philosophy is a form of self-defense, by the way, how do you guys feel about that statement? Do you feel that philosophy is a form of self-defense? Uh, I know that in ancient Asian traditions, their their martial arts were always accompanied by philosophy, right? Um, if philosophy is a form of self-defense, then those children whose lives are most threatened have the greatest need of philosophy. Apart from physical harm, the gravest threat to a child is destroying his or her sense of self by stealing it from him or her. Franz Fanon, 
has detailed the cause of this pathology in black skin, white mass. He recalls how he was taught about his ancestors, the Gauls, in his French controlled school in Martinique. At the same time, however, Fanon warned of the opposite danger. Children who are taught a gospel of negritude also have a sense of self stripped away. Although the effects may not be as heavily apparent as in the colonial case. Fanon claimed that we must be scrupulously true to history, yet interpret that history in such a way that we can join together to form a global community. Well, wasn't, wasn't Fanon proud of his white wife? Wasn't he, wasn't he also the coach who was proud of his white wife? Uh, in the same vein, Ivan Van Sertima claimed in his introduction to Charles S. Finch's The African Background to Medical Science, Essays in African History, Science, and Civilizations, that the first crude phase of the struggle to revise our history is passing. Those earlier hollow boasts about the vague and vast achievements have given way to something deeper, more cautious and yet more confident, more dangerous, closer to the detail of historical truth, and therefore more, more revolutionary, right? So, you know, if you read between the lines here, right? Guys like uh, Van Sertema, right? And even perhaps Fanon wouldn't particularly like some of these DVD uh, movies that come out, you know, by your favorite grifters and stuff like that, right? Uh, but before I go for I want to ask this question in the chat room. Let me see if I get the chat room jumping again. Um, who are, you know, who are um, the African-centered philosophers you would want your small child to become familiar with? Who are some of the African-centered philosophers you would want your small child to be familiarized with at an early age, right? Answer that in the chat room. I'll read your responses live on air. However, Stephen Howe, in 1998, criticized Finch for relying on historical accounts that arise from an Afrocentric tradition, having no, no resonance in historical sources outside that tradition. How join other critics of Afrocentric thought, such as uh, Mary Lefkowitz and Wilson Moses, in claiming that Afrocentric scholarship is fighting its current battles with outdated research? Howe's critique of Afrocentric scholarship is important because that scholarship forms the backbone of a good deal of current Afrocentric education. Afrocentric education uh, grounded in philosophy will meet criticism on the critics' own grounds. To cite an example, one of Job's most powerful arguments for cultural diffusion between Egypt and Greece was to cite Greek texts claiming that important Greek figures such as Pythagoras and Plato had spent years studying in Egypt. However, Job's critics such as Lefkowitz never denied the literal statements in the text. Rather, they denied that the authors meant what they said. The argument is plausible. Greek writers wanted to enhance the legitimacy of their traditions by claiming links to more ancient and respected traditions. Look at that. The most powerful monumental culture of antiquity was the Egyptian. Greeks claimed direct lineage from the Egyptians to legitimize their own ideas. Critics of Job have claimed that the proof of his hypothesis of cultural diffusion from Egypt to Greece should be supported by an abundance of Egyptian artifacts found in Greek archaeological uh, sites and in linguistic and intellectual carryovers. Fair-minded scholars such as Stanley Burstein in 1994 argue that more research is necessary to settle the question. However, this research must be cutting edge, combining techniques from classics, Egyptology, and archaeology. Ironically, Howe 
himself suggests a route to undercutting critics of Afrocentric theory on their own ground. Job claims that ancient Egyptian thought is the first philosophical speculation recorded in history. But how cites Kwame Appiah's 1992 remark that Egyptian religious thought is no quote-unquote more than a systemized but uncritical folk philosophy, a set of beliefs lacking in any procedures for interrogating their own status, end of quote. Just before this citation, how remarked that the distinguished German Egyptologist Jan Asman uh, viewed Egyptian religious thought as evolving, quote, under the new kingdom into a full-fledged and dynamic theology, more complex than early Judaic monotheism, end of quote. How did not cite Asman's article, quote, state and religion in the new kingdom, end of quote. In that article, Asman stated that according to the scriptures, the Israelite uh, religion went through its decisive formative phase in Egypt. This phase followed the subversion of the classical concept of Ma'at by the theology of divine will in the new, ki in, in, in the new kingdom. Asman also noted that another prominent Egyptologist, James Allen, described the new kingdom theology and cosmology as a natural philosophy. Allen published Genesis in Egypt, the philosophy of ancient Egyptian creation accounts. Allen made the Stalin claims that the quote, three great theological systems of Thebes, um, uh, Heliopolis and Memphis are themselves aspects of a single consistent understanding of the world and its origins. Egyptian cosmology represents a fairly uniform picture of the universe throughout Egyptian history. This picture is philosophical because Egyptians, like other uh, humans, ponder, speculate, and attempt to communicate abstract concepts to others. Unlike the Egyptians, we moderns have divorced philosophy as a discipline from religion, and we are the poor for it. In African, um, spiritual systems um, in African spiritual systems uh, it's steeped in philosophy right which is another reason why we need to get back to it right uh, you know in, in, in past some um, episodes I've read like Yoruba proverbs and stuff like that a lot of that is a part of the of a lot of that stuff is a part of their philosophy a part of their religion Etc. That's something that we need to get back to. In the chat room, I see the pro-black perspective, of course, says Gavi is the philosopher for everyone, right? Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there are others as well. Um, but Gavi is absolutely the, grace, the greatest starting place. I mean, just pick up the opinions and philosophies of Marcus Gavi, right? Uh, a third prominent uh, Egyptologist, Eric Hornung, argued in his Conceptions of God in Ancient Egypt, the one and the many, that ancient Egyptians were reluctant to divorce important concepts that we moderns take to be mutually incompatible. For the Egyptians, the entire extent of the, ex of the, uh, of the existent, both in space and in time, is embedded in the limitless expanses of the non-existent. The non-existent does not even stop short at the boundaries of the existent, but penetrates all of creation. Hornung claimed that the Egyptian unification of the existent and non-existent was, quote, the earliest attempt in human history, as early as the third millennium BC, to work out the intellectual basis of an ontology, end of quote. Furthermore, this ontology was at once theoretical and practical. The Egyptians retained a pragmatic attitude to their ontology, using concepts they were able to live with, which sustained their own lives. Scarcely any other civilization has integrated the non-existent and its creative potential so perfectly into its way of life, acknowledging 
to non-existent without falling prey to it. Perhaps this is the source of Egyptian creativity, or the balance and sense of the measure of things which we encounter in all manifestations of Egyptian culture. In an excursus on the problem of Egyptian logic, Hornung claimed that Egyptologists would do well to pay attention to the work of contemporary scientists in the area of quantum or model logic. Hornung's impressive work attempts to show that neither the concepts of monotheism nor polytheism accurately describe the ancient Egyptian uh, conceptions of God. Hornung admitted that the intellectual basis of a many-valued logic remains uncertain. Nevertheless, the, sophi the sophistication of Egyptian uh, discussions of God suggests to Hornung that we may need a new method to evaluate them, one that the complexities of quantum mechanics may lead us to develop. Brings us to a section called New Philosophies of... Uh, brings us to a section called New Philosophies of Africana History. In the chat room, Kevin Care 42 says, Akhenaten was the first pharaoh to introduce monotheism, the Aton. His wife was the lovely Queen Tai. The Muzungus try to say she was of Eurasian heritage. The work of Hanong, Allen, and Asman should be integral to a philosophical Afrocentric curriculum. Is that right? Integral? Okay. However, a philosophical reflection should not be limited to Egypt alone. Philosophical Afrocentric curricula should offer students both uh, macro histories and micro histories of Africana experience. In the former category, uh, category Jared Diamond's 1997 recent Guns, Germs, and Steel explained Africa's macrocultural development through biogeography. For Diamond, Africans develop monumental cultures only in Egypt and Ethiopia because of the continent's extraordinarily diverse ecosystems. Africa has a north-south axis, unlike Eurasia, whose axis is east-west. Temperate and disease barriers hindered agricultural technology transfer between northern and southern Africa. The tsetse fly, in particular, slowed the diffusion of cattle-based cultures through Africa. Philosophers of history, such as Hegel, have argued that Africa's mountainous terrain prevented the development of civilization in all Africa except Egypt. Hegel argued that the Nile's facilitation of communication and agricultural abundance at once separated Egyptian from all other African cultures and made possible the monumental Egyptian civilization. Hegel's historical knowledge of Africa was fanciful, to say the least. His unimpeachable sources include European missionaries. Most telling, Hegel makes no mention of Africa's other great river of civilization, the Niger. John Reader's Africa, a biography of the continent, presents a careful synopsis of the extraordinary civilizations that developed along the Niger River. Like Diamond, however, he explained the lack of monumental culture along the Niger through biogeographical causes. In spite of easy communication and abundant food on the Niger, tropical diseases such as malaria, sleeping sickness, uh, schizo, schizosomiasis or whatever, and a hookworm prevented the population growth uh, so necessary for monumental cultures. Unlike European diseases such as smallpox or the Black Plague, exposure conferred no immunity. The only evolutionary response to any of these tropical diseases came in the form of the debilitating sickle cell anemia. Environmental conditions kept tropical African populations from reaching a monumental critical mass. 
Africans were constrained by, quote, their ability to accommodate the ecological realities confronting them, including predators, parasites, and disease, end of quote. The Africans who left Africa in the first migration of Homo sapiens, sapiens, multiplied from just hundreds to over 300 million by AD 1500, while the population of Africa had risen from 1 million to only 47 million. That's something to look into. I gotta research that. As we shall see shortly, however, Reader was careful to point out that African cultures have made extraordinary contributions to world culture, although current evidence points to only two monumental cultures in Africa. But only micro histories of Africana culture will bring the full extent of African creativity to light. Ironically, overemphasis of macro historical descriptions of African experience can hinder this process. For example, extreme Afrocentrists might argue that an overriding cultural unity of African shapes, the philosophical development of Africans both on the continent and in the diaspora, resulting in a convergence on holistic philosophies that are antithetical to European atomistic thought. On this hypothesis, difference between the monumental cultures of Egypt and Ethiopia and the rest of Africa are marginal. Africans in the diaspora have as much of a share in the continental culture as do continental Africans. This conjecture is so general and speculative that it does not lend itself to consensual testing. However, cultural anthropologists such as Melville Herskovitz uh, have argued that more narrowly specifiable African cultural traits have carried over from Africa to the United States. Although Herskovitz's claims are so general as to be philosophical rather than anthropological, researchers such as Robert Farris Thomas have made claims about specific cultural transfers from the Yoruba and other African civilizations to African Americans in the United States. Thompson argued that some Africanisms, such as the expressions cool and getting down, have diffused into a wide range of U.S. cultures. Other researchers have asserted that Africanisms have influenced U.S. cultures in more... Can you guys hear me? Can you guys still hear me? Uh... You might have to refresh if you can't hear me. Uh, I was disconnected for a second there. The pro-black perspective makes an excellent point. Hegel is instrumental to Marxism, right? Okay, you guys hear me, great. Yeah, Hegel is instrumental to Marxism, right? Which says a lot, by the way. Thompson argued, uh, sorry, Thompson's claims have the merit of being highly specific and so subject to some measure of consensual testing. His example suggests a research program for investigating links between African cultures and African-American philosophies. If good, uh, if good es epi, uh, epistemological grounds support them, such links would deserve a prominent place in Afrocentric curricula. A first step in such research might be a careful examination of the African record for examples of cultures that have avoided a self-centered ethnocentrism. Anthropologists Roderick and Susan McIntosh have argued that a combination of environmental conditions and human ingenuity in the Niger Delta region in Mali produce a model for resolving ethnic conflict that flourished for 1600 years from the fifth century BCE to the, to the 13th century CE. Complex variations in rainfall in the region made ethnic groups with different economic uh, specializations closely dependent on one another for their survival and flourishing, right? Uh, the, Bam the Bambara and Dogon farm millet and sorghum the Fulani and Toreg were herders, and the Bozo and Samono were fishermen. Jene, Jeno, an archaeological site near the present-day city of Jene on the 
Bari River and Mali is the central focus of this constellation of cultures. Although there is no monumental architecture or burial sites such as are found in ancient Egypt and Ethiopia, there is amazing evidence of mastery of ethnic conflict. Continuing destruction of urban sites by burning is common in the archaeological record, but there's no evidence of this at Jenny Geno. The population was quite large, as was the potential for ethnic conflict. The inhabitants of Jenny Geno develop ingenious ways of resolving ethnic conflict. In readers' words, quote, the myths and legends of the Delta are in fact ecological abstractions, which incorporate the realities of existence, namely a highly unpredictable environment and the incompatible strategies of specialists exploring it into systems of belief, end of quote. Niger Delta myths identify ethnic groups through their mutual obligations to one another. People know how to behave because they know they are different and this mutual respect allows specialization to flourish. And material symbols of group identity, like hairstyles, scarification, dress, etc., to develop. Macintosh and Macintosh hypothesized that the material culture shows no evidence of a centralized authority. The inhabitants retain their economic specializations. Quote, the pull of economic integration produce a web of shared myth and belief that emphasize both individual ethnic identity and mutual interdependence. That's something that we gotta, that's something that we gotta get on, right? In this time here, right? The prominent African-American philosopher, Elaine Locke, mentioned by Only Tase in the uh, chat, uh, has famously proclaimed that the ground of human unity must be cultural difference. Locke's insistence on this point flies in the face of the history of ethnic wars and genocide. But the evidence from, Geno Geno, but from Jenny Geno may help establish the plausibility of Locke's hypothesis. Creators of Afrocentric curriculum might be tempted to claim causal links between Jenny Geno and Locke's philosophy of unity through difference and to include such claims in their curricula. However, many theories may explain the congruence ranging from coincidence to cultural transfer to a common need to resolve cultural conflict. Scholars who have decided in advance that a hypothesis of cultural transmission must be, or indeed cannot be, a plausible hypothesis will not undertake the arduous research necessary for resolving such a complex question. Extreme Afrocentrists might claim that the Gene Geno model for resolving ethnic conflict is simply one expression of a continental cultural pattern. But research-minded Afrocentrists will start with the particulars of African life before leaping to such grand generalizations. Nevertheless, reflection on the Afrocentric hypothesis of continental cultural unity is precisely the philosophical stimulus that inspired my interest and Africana cultural transfer. Philosophical ambition urges us to generalize from six Niger Delta ethnic groups to the whole of West Africa, to all Africana peoples on the continent and in the diaspora. But, this, but the philosophical restraint urges us to regard Jenny Geno as a stimulus for further research and as a model for resolution of ethnic conflict that the whole world would do well to ponder in these perilous times. You guys are listening to this live on playback. Were you familiar with Jenny Geno? And if so, how so? How can an Afrocentric curriculum embrace these distinctive approaches toward Africana material without hopelessly confusing students? The Jenny Geno archaeological record can inspire Afrocentric curricula in two ways. First, such curricula can link imaginative philosophical speculation with detailed research, particularly in archaeology, cultural anthropology, and history. Second, in homage to our Jenny Geno ancestors, 
Afrocentric curricula can synthesize what is culturally unique with what is broadly shared by many human groups. Students should start the education with self-definition in the context of their own experience. I agree with that. But their definitions must expand to include their families, neighbors, culturally significant, God damn it, culturally significant others, nation, and finally the globe. Yeah, that's sound. That sound. Uh, Afrocentric curricula can synthesize what is unique in Africana experience with revised versions of the trivium and quadrivium that are universal in institutions of higher learning throughout the world. Du Bois claimed that the origin of this universal curriculum may be traced through Rome and Greece back to ancient Egypt. Quote, the riddle of existence is the college curriculum that was laid before the pharaohs, that was taught in the groves by Plato, that formed the trivium and quadrivium, and is to and is today laid before the freedmen's sons by Atlanta University, end of quote. Du Bois' assertion should be the challenge that launches not a thousand ships, but a thousand PhD dissertations. How do you guys feel about Du Bois' assertion, right? How much attention should students, uh, how much attention Students should focus on each of these stages of self-definition depends on their unique circumstances. Denying Africans the right to education for much of their tenure in the Americas limited their access to conventional tools of self-definition. Philosophical Afrocentric curricula in predominantly black schools will help amplify Africana resistance to being defined by the other. And that's the end of the paper, All right? What did you guys think of the paper? Uh, answer that question while I um, head to one last station ID. But that was the paper. Tell me what your thoughts are on that paper. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And as always, check out the Queen's Council podcast, also here on KWAZ Radio. In the chat room, uh, in the chat room, uh, Pro Black Perspective was telling me no need to refresh, they can hear me. Uh, I only said that because my OBS studio said, said I was disconnected and that I had to reconnect. So I just want to make sure you guys didn't lose, didn't lose out, you know? Uh, wow. I'm, I'm looking at the numbers here. Uh, I have twice as many likes as listeners. I appreciate that. Um, you know, make sure like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't before, click the bell to be notified when I have new content. Uh, but I appreciate all the likes today is, uh, today. Uh, KW Dawn 7 says, as I remember, Locke was an integrationist who bet against Gavi. That's, that's good to know, too. Uh, um, Alan Leroy Locke. That's a, that's a black name for you right there, boy. Uh, 
Uh, the Rico Cooper photography says, sounds like we had an appreciation for decentralized economics early on. As you know, the Rico Cooper photography always drops some investing tip, some stock tip for us. The Rico, if you don't mind, if you have anything for us tonight, please post it in the chat so that we can get in, into it. By the way, uh, you guys should be uh, on the Discord server, right? You should be on the Discord server. You could find the link in the description. Uh, you could also find it. I'm posting it right now in the chat room. Uh, you guys should be on the Discord because uh, there's a lot of information that drops. Kevin Care 42, Dorico Cooper Photography are always dropping some gems. Um, I am not able to get to all of them, but when I do, uh, it's real good stuff. So you guys should hop on there and check it out, all right? Uh, the Rico Cooper Photography just said important paper. I like doing a deep dive into who, into how we function prior to Urugu, particularly in education and economics. Yeah, that's the thing I would like to, to do too. And so the reason I choose all these papers is, is, a, is it's a part of my personal deep dive. When I come across things that I hadn't been familiar with before, I'm appreciative of that. And behind the scenes, I make sure I go and study it as well. Um, so this is why I do the shows, these shows that I do and these papers, because it's a personal journey too for me. I'm trying to immerse myself a bit more and understand our origins a bit more and try trying to understand it from a from a black uh from a black perspective or you know a black take uh more so than more so than 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 anyone else's take as we saw with Hegel Hegel was a dude talking about Africa and he and he he knew not of Africa right uh Dorico Kubo Photography says he'll be posting some important stock tips in the Discord. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I hope you guys are taking advantage of all the information that he and Kevin Care 42 and sometimes Machiavelli and others are hopping on and uh, dropping this information. Oh, yeah, the Pro Black Perspective is in the chat room. I just wanted to share something with. Pro black perspective. Let me see if I could find it. Uh, earlier, I got a message from a brother. What's his brother's name? Uh, uh, Ra Taneder Maat Amen Ra. And he said, the content of the Bitter Medicine and Pro Black Perspective podcast a par excellence. And then he asked me if I ever heard of, of the, the of the Tabum people. And I, I had never heard of the Tabum people, but I do appreciate his, you know, sharing this information with me. And that's the kind of stuff we want. You know, as a matter of fact, I should tell him to post this uh, to the Discord, but the Tabum people, if you, if you guys have ever heard of the Tabum people, let me know. The Tabum people, also known as the Agudas, are the Afro-Brazilian community in the south of Ghana, who were mostly of Yoruba descent. The Tabum people are an Afro-Brazilian community of former slave returnees. When they arrived in Jamestown, Accra, they could speak only Portuguese and would conspicuously use the phrase Tabum, which means okay. Right, uh, so the Ga and Dangbi people who primarily inhabit the Jamestown neighborhood in Accra, South Ghana, started to call them the Tabom. Have you guys, did you guys know about the Tabom people? Right? <laughs> the pro-black perspective said, yeah, good people. Look at this guy. Uh, yeah. 
so um you know so that was that, so oh uh, i guess the pro-black perspective might be referring to the brother who uh who said that right but uh you know i i thought that was a good compliment uh to both myself and only to say from the pro-black perspective mm -hmm. And you guys should also check out these other shows as well. I'm sure some of you are because I've seen some of you in the chat room, right? Anyway, that's the paper tonight. I want to thank you guys for for coming through. Uh, if you have any last comment or anything about the paper or anything in general, uh, post those now. If you want to talk about Derek Chauvin, post it while I'm going through and hailing up everyone who was here live with me today. Uh, the Pro Black Perspective, of course, Dorico Cooper Photography, uh, KW Dawn 7, uh, who else? Kevin Care 42, of course, Life with Nelly again. Good evening to Nelly. Uh, the Pro Black Perspective was here, like I said, KW Dawn 7. Uh, who else was here? NYC Sports Archives was here early. Those guys were having a conversation even before I came on. Uh, NYC Beauties was here, of course. Black Excellence, you know, and I appreciate all of you for tuning in. That is the show. I will be back on Thursday. I'm not sure if I'll read a paper on Thursday or we'll just chop it up and shoot the breeze about what's going on in the community wherever we reside that might be something i do on thursday all right until next time guys peace and thanks for tuning in thanks for listening to the beta medicine podcast with your host koku if you like what you just heard we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.